Welcome to the Influence Factory podcast. This program is dedicated to support professionals who have a desire to develop their digital business influence so they can navigate through a fast-paced, constantly growing digital world. We invite newcomers as well as our family of business influencers to a place to play, share ideas, questions, tips, and guidance with other thought leaders around the globe. Sit back and enjoy our program with your host, Dean Delisle, as he interviews guests. News and commentary are provided by Jackson Delisle and Monica Hacker. Power Move lessons are provided by the Influencer Marketing Department at Social Jack. And production, editing, and distribution is provided by the Social Jack production team. All right. This week's influencer guest, Joe Carnes, will be joining us to discuss the importance of climbing to the top of Google, uh, the leverage of content as well as social media and how that affects things. And then also we're going to dig a little bit, not just into keywords, but into a little bit of artificial intelligence and what's called identity resolution. So we can't wait to hear more about this. So Joe Carnes, come on down. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Let's how you see. doing? There we are. Yeah, Hello. Welcome. All right. And Joe's usually in the control room live from Michigan, right? So uh, helping us and all of our clients with websites and uh, all the cool things that we're about to talk about. So in the world of, uh, you know, in the world of actually um, search, it seems like a lot of things have stayed the same, but also a lot of things are different because they say the algorithms change all the time. So give me a little synopsis of the landscape and, and what you think is, is new to search and, and you know, a little bit about the science behind these algorithms. Right. Well, things with Google's search algorithms always change and uh, seemingly more often now. And they claim that's because, well, they want to produce a better user experience and connect you with what you're searching for on its primary platform and through YouTube and other things. So for them to do that, they're focusing more on what proves out to connect people with what they're looking for the closest and to weed out the things that maybe aren't producing the best results or are being leveraged by cheaters. Uh, so what, what, can, what, what makes a cheater a cheater? Well, if you get an email, uh, usually from overseas somewhere, promising you 1,000 powerful backlinks pointing to your website that's going to instantly put it on page one of Google search results for a really expensive keyword phrase that's either not real or they're giving you backlinks on kind of a website that has a million backlinks on it. And Google while it used to give some weight to those kinds of backlinks, it's now saying, wait a minute, we detect that your backlinks are coming from like a spam site or a link farm or this black hat type stuff. And those aren't real uh, endorsements, so to speak, by reputable websites. So they'll basically de-index all of those links so they give you no credit for them anymore. And that could cripple your site or it could leave those links in place. And basically what would be even worse de-index your entire site if you wow. are a repeat offender or maybe you've used, unfortunately, uh, kind of shady SEO companies in the past. So then for those of us that are not cheaters, uh, it's still tactical, though, for us to get our site listed on other sites and pointing back to our main website. That's still legit as long as they can tell it's not one of these scam sites or something else, right? Yes, absolutely. So even though a lot of things have changed with SEO, there's still one thing, and probably only one thing, that has never changed, is that other powerful websites that will give you a backlink, or in other words, point to your site. It's like getting a powerful endorsement from a real human being that's very credible. So you've, if you have a very credible site, like in our case, we're doing more SEO driven press releases. Those are powerful because the news sites have high domain authority, meaning Google uh, sees them as very reputable authorities and any website that they point to, Google thinks, wow, okay, well, if ABC is pointing to Dean's website, we think we're going to give Dean some kudos because of that. 
Yeah, so they see the legitimacy in that. And so um, so what Joe's talking about is we do what are called SEO-driven press releases. Now, we do get them published anywhere from 300 to 500 news agencies, but really the power in that is that we have three keyword phrases, which we'll talk about in a minute, and those then point back to a certain website. And what's interesting, Joe, is I just saw a buddy of mine who wrote an article for Forbes, and I was like hey, why didn't you put your website in the bottom of it in your bio? And he goes, I forgot. They told me I could. And so it was after the fact, and there was no way to put it in there. That would have been a big one. So if you're publishing, if you're putting content out there, a backlink could come from YouTube. It could come from ABC News. It could come from LinkedIn. So don't forget to take those authority sites that Joe talked about. And Joe, what's the definition of a high-ranking or authority site? besides a new site? Um, there's still some tools out there like Moz and some other ones that have this authority ranking. Um, so I think Moz recently changed their, they, they actually charge money now. So that's not a good example, but we can post those a little bit later. Okay. Um, so there's, there's kind of a universal ranking that if you have a Moz score or if you have a domain authority number, um, it's, it's kind of a culmination of the top, uh, most reputable SEO services like Moz that aggregate those together and they give you some sort of score. So it's not really anything that's specifically from Google per se, but it's usually a pretty close representation. It's kind of like an Alexa score. Alexa has uh, unfortunately been bought by Amazon right? Um, and they don't really, the website doesn't really mean anything anymore in terms of what it used to, but an Alexa score was kind of like where you sit in the whole universe of websites as far as ranking goes. Yeah, I know. It was always like our goal to like get above like a million. The top, <laughs> which is, the top 1 million is good in Alexa. It used to be the top 100,000 is like the holy grail. Gold. Yeah, that's gold. That's gold. Um, one of the things that we have been doing more recently and which was a big change, um, uh, or at least we saw it sort of more for transform. And I don't think a lot of people know the power of it. But uh, when we look at the first page of Google, whether we're typing in our company name or keywords that we want to rank for, um, one of the other important things is to make sure we have our business properly listed, yep. right? So we have uh, Google business pages. And um, what's interesting is as we is we start to dig more into those or watch them evolve, it's almost like they're turning those Google business pages into like a mini social network site. I mean, you can post content up there. You can... Mm-hmm pictures up there. Now, because Google owns that, I'm just guessing that there's authority and relevancy to making sure that that page is as optimized as possible. Is that true or? Absolutely. So that's the second of the three ways to get to the top of Google in 2019. I was just just guessing. (laughs) Is there's the, what we just touched on, which is getting powerful backlinks from reputable websites. And you don't need a lot of them. If you even have like five big name websites or pretty big websites, but in your niche that point to your website, um, that's really great because that immediately shows Google that, hey, you you say your website specializes in X based on the words on your site, but these websites pointing to you also specialize in X and have a high domain authority. So we view you as the you know, expert in that field and we're going to rank your site higher. So that's the first thing. The second thing is your Google business profile. So anyone can set one up. And as many of you probably know, you have to type in a physical business address and the card, the postcard gets mailed to you. You get the code, you verify. And but that one simple thing that albeit might be a pain in the butt, especially if you're in a huge high rise, high rise building where your mail gets lost a lot. Um, that instantly gives you more credibility in Google because remember their number one goal is connecting you with the right thing that you're searching for. That's valid. And a huge validating factor is that you've proven who you are. You've proven your real business and moreover, you have some physical location. Now, some people don't have physical locations, so you might try using your home address if you're willing to put your home address on the map. Others have tried using PO boxes, which sometimes work, sometimes don't. Um, but that's the best way uh, to get that initial uh, bump in Google is to put your business in the business profile and set that up as complete as possible. 
and there's all new things before you can even put like a description in there. So you couldn't put any keywords in there. Uh, now I think they give you like 300 characters or some little snippet, two or three sentences where you can describe uh, what your business does. And I wouldn't overstuff it with keywords, but you basically just say what you do in there. That's going to also help you rank higher for those keyword phrases. Yeah, that's nice. And then one thing that I think is critical uh, based on the audience that we have. So we have a lot of business influencers that work at companies or maybe even have companies, but they're also influencers themselves. You know, So they're public figures, they're speakers, they're authors, um, and they're looking to to accelerate their own name in, in the world. So you're suggesting that if we have one for our business and we are also a business influencer, we should also claim a page for our own name. You could. Um, these are reviewed by a human at Google. And if they feel that there's, that it's not, doesn't really work or it doesn't seem real, uh, they might start looking it up and trying to figure it out if it's real another way. Well, we're, um, not, we're not saying they're not real. They're influencers. So, you know, if they're, if they're an entity within their own name, you know, getting paid for speaking, yep. um, you know, and, uh, things like oh, that. Um, I totally get it. The point is that they're trying to show a business on a map, right? So if you have a physical location and the name of your business is your name, Obviously, that's totally cool. Is that going to be the case? 99% of the cases, probably not. So it's that mismatch that they're, the physical location won't really make sense. Now, if you said your business name is Dean Delisle Public Speaker or Dean Delisle Public Speaking Services or something like that, and then the, they look up the business or they do the drive-by thing view and they see there's a sign on the front that says Dean Delhelm Public Speaking or something that's remotely close. They'll put it like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, but some, there's just a higher uh, probability that they may have more questions. Right. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because I noticed that we have one set up for my, uh, for my name as well as for the company. So uh, just interesting how it all comes together. But the idea here is to, and if people want to check out about that, they just go to Google and um, like Google business page or something like that. Uh, business.google.com is where you go to set up your business profile. I think you can also go to google.com forward slash business nowadays. They have a couple different ways to get there. Uh, or well, you we can just, just, we can just Google, <laughs> Google business profile and uh, you'll be able to set that up. Right. Cool. All right. And then uh, I always encourage people and we tell people, so, uh, so in this, you know, I noticed that we had loaded a lot of our event pictures up there and some other cool things. Um, my, my thought is that when we tell people to load up their content, it's like, if, if it's your content and you want your name on it, make sure you have your company name. If you personally own the content, put your name on there. So if I'm looking to get more ranking or more authority for my name on the internet, I was always taught to put my name on the content. So I've published hundreds or thousands of videos and PowerPoint decks and articles and things like that. And I've always been conscious about my name being on those. And then also the business name. So is that still hold true of naming the content before it even goes up? The jury's still out on that. I mean, there's machines reading everything about the image and I've, I've read some stuff all the way from it doesn't matter all the way to using sp special tools to into embed metadata into yeah. the image. I mean, there's a totally different uh, sides of the spectrum there. I, I think that if realistically, it probably has a small amount of benefit, um, but a more visual impacting thing is all images you upload can have a caption. And while it may or may not fa factor into the, indexing of whether or not your profile ranks higher because of what you name those images, whatever's in that little caption shows up when the user clicks on one of the images and it opens like that light box thing to scroll through the images, they see what that caption is for each one. So it could be your domain name. So something that's more visually impacted might be your name if you're trying to brand your name. So it's good to have some kind of caption in with every image. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, what else can we do to climb to that top of Google? Well, that leads us to number three of three of the best ways to climb to the top of Google in 2019, which is get more activity around your business profile. So once you have your business profile built, that's really just getting your business on the map that you exist at all. 
So remember, because Google's number one goal is to connect people searching with the best and correct answers, they also want to connect people with the highest quality answers in terms of other reviews and things like that. So if you can start getting five-star reviews on your business profile, even one five-star review, if you only have one review, make sure it's a five-star review. And Google will say, okay, well, there's a lot of competition in this dense area of downtown Chicago. And there's you know these seven companies that all kind of do the same thing. Right. But wow, Forward Progress has you know 15 reviews and they're averaging five stars out of five. So if you're not on the top three map spot, you can get bumped up into the top three. If you're number three, you can get bumped up to number one or number two. The star rating goes a long way in validating that you're providing quality services, not just that you exist. So there's um, the reviews. And there's also what's called citations and social signals. So the more... uh, Reference type websites, yellow pages. There's now one called brown pages. There's all these different websites. Really? Like, yeah, there's like 40 of these websites. And they're very basic. Most of them are free to create an account on. And all you need to make sure that you do is copy and paste your business address exactly as it appears in that Google business profile. So if you don't remember how you set up or spelled your address, just Google the name of your business, your card will pop up. We copy it, paste it either into a text doc for when you go and build all those citations or just have both screens open. Either way, it has to match exactly to get the benefit out of it because it's kind of like getting a backlink, but for your business profile card. The more places online, like Foursquare and I think Facebook even has Facebook places now, the more places online where that exact match business identity and location exists, it's like revalidating everything about what you validated with Google as far as your business is concerned. So that's what citations are. It's having a listing for your business using the identical phone number, name of business, and physical location and website, which is very important. And it's also in some of those that that have a follow link with your website, you also get a backlink out of it that points right. to your website. And those directory sites are usually pretty high in reputation. Um, so there's that. And then, then there's social signals. So all that is, is how many people in your area, in your market area, are not only looking at your business profile, but acting on it in some way. So Think of all of like the famous restaurants in your area that you'd like to go to. When you Google them, you might be like, press directions. Now you're driving there in your car. So that tells Google that you don't just exist and you don't just have good reviews, but people are actually going there. So if people, the, the most powerful signal is the directions, uh, comments, um, clicking on different buttons in your business profile. So if someone pulls, sees your business profile, Google still doesn't know whether or not they're actually looking at it with their yeah, eyeballs. They use it or not. Is it useful right. to them? Right? But if they're pressing website or they're pressing menu, because sometimes, you know, the restaurants have menu in there now or about. So the more clicking and engagement there is with your business profile, those are social signals. Got it. So, <clears throat> and there's no way to really promote that unless you do some other campaigns about letting people know go to our profile here it is and click here to you know is, uh, can you do things like that and, you know. yeah so what what some companies do is they'll pull up the they'll get drilled down into their business profile so they'll put in the, their company name and the full address so that you're sure it's going to show up when that whole url is typed in or copy and pasted. So what you're essentially doing is creating a direct link to your business profile. Uh, And then you can copy and paste that super long link and do things like send the link to customers you've just done business with and say, hey, it was great working with you. If you could click here and give us a review on Google, we'd really appreciate it. We get a lot of referrals from having good reviews. Um, You can come right on, ask for a five-star review and give that link. Um, so you can drive traffic to that business card, sort of, and either ask for reviews or ask users to do something on there that can only be done on there, usually leaving the positive reviews. And, then, and we all 
remember that it's good to be proactive and asking for good reviews because unfortunately people only take the time to leave reviews usually when they've had a bad experience. <laughs> right, exactly. So getting exactly. good reviews up front is like an insurance policy. Well, and I've seen places that say, uh, you know, uh, please leave us, uh, you know, a review. If you're not happy with your experience, please let a manager know immediately. Right. So um, so I, th- yeah. I think people are looking for creative ways to diffuse the negative experience mm-hmm. uh, document if you will. <clears throat> so, uh, so, you know, so that's interesting. So then where do Bing and Yahoo and other, um, you know, websites or search engines, you know, because a lot of people will say, well, should I put some money, you know, Yahoo just sent me something. Should I put some money on uh, spending advertising dollars on Bing or Yahoo? You yeah. know, so. Uh, there are, there's still some benefit in running a search campaign on Bing, Yahoo really doesn't do it anymore because they just got bought again and they're doing more like video type stuff now uh, through AOL, I think. But on Bing- AOL still exists? (laughs) Indirectly, yes. (laughs) So uh, we actually have some clients with AOL email addresses, so. Okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If you're in in an industry that's very competitive and very high volume, think like auto sales, things like that, uh, attorneys. There's some benefits of running on Bing as well because there's less competition there. And even if it's only 9% of total search traffic these days, if you can get those high value clicks for 40% cheaper than all of your competitors that are kind of in this rat race on AdWords, there's some benefit to using that. But right. if you're in a lower volume type industry, you know you might get only a handful of clicks in Bing. So it it definitely doesn't hurt. But if you're trying to budget your time and put it where it's going to produce the best outcome, um, you spending hours setting up your ads in Bing is may not worth it. So it depends on how much volume and what kind of industry you're in. Yeah. So I'm curious from the audience that uh, is logged in today. So what search engine do you use the most? I'm sort of curious. We'll take our own private poll here. So we'll let them uh, log in. So, oh, there you go. Um, we have mostly all Googles coming in. So you said YouTube as a search engine, Joe? Yeah. Did you know that YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world? Who owns YouTube? Google. <laughs> so what do you mean by that? Because in terms of where people search, right? Yeah, it uses a different but similar algorithm. Uh, but it is its own search engine. Wow. YouTube wasn't always owned by Google. That's right. Remember back. Right. <clears throat> so uh, that's interesting. And then, but I mean, they're mostly searching on YouTube, but it's still a search engine. Right. So if you go to youtube.com, that is its own search engine. So it's not Google's engine at all. It's, it's part of it, but it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a similar algorithm, but it's different. That's so, interesting. So there's YouTube that can show as results in Google's search. Right. But not vice versa. Interesting. Uh, that brings up another uh, point. If you remember, I think this was about five or six years ago when somebody was like, we have this new, you know, climb to the top of Google thing. And they basically were producing 10 videos with the keywords that you wanted to rank for in all those 10 videos. And that was at least for a period of time, jumping people to the top of Google because they could dominate that top page. Is that fair to say that that doesn't work as well anymore? (laughs) That would be one of those sort of cheating, not really cheating, but kind of gaming the system and using it in a way that the platform didn't intend for it to be used for. And it was, uh, sort of effective in the beginning only because no one else was doing it yet because they haven't really they hadn't really figured out how to do what SEO tactics were done 12 years ago on Google but then got overused and phased out and blocked could sort of be be done on YouTube so it worked well on YouTube for a while and not really anymore yeah so um, what's what's interesting is I you know I've seen uh, uh, just, uh, in, in the search engine results, it'll now categorize all those and clump them and say videos. And Mm -hmm. now all of a sudden, all those videos that were taken the page, all the page up is, are now in a category called videos and other content is inserted. Right. Once in a while, you could still see a video on the main results, but it's going to have to be very relevant 
clicked on all the time and ranked in Google's mind more importantly than those search text-based search results. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. So let's talk a little bit about keywords because I think people get confused between keywords, keyword phrases, and long tail keywords. Uh, Give us, give us like the, maybe your simplest definition of keywords and then, you know, how should we look them, how look at them, how, how often should we update them, et cetera. Right. So I think this is totally obvious. A lot of clients don't, Um, but (laughs) but most simply, what do you do? What are you doing here? Um, So it's, it's what do you do as a business? And the second thing to wrap around that and shape it with is, okay, this is what you do. These are your services. If you were searching for service A that you just mentioned, how would you look for it on Google? Right. So if you do HVAC repair, uh, you might say, well, one of my services is I repair AC units. Okay. Well, that probably isn't how you would search for that. So how would you search for that in Google? Like, well, okay, I'd probably type in AC repair Elmhurst. Right. Okay. So that if you that's an area you focus on and you're more of a local services type person, that's going to be one of your top keyword phrases of how you want to be found is AC repair Elmhurst. Now, is it is it fair to say that, you know, with that example, I would also want to cover myself and also pick air conditioning repair? Absolutely. Because Google doesn't know that I mean AC um, cause you know, that's a type of current too. So it, it could be AC and it could be air conditioner. So, right. so how do you figure out what thing, what, which phrases to actually mm-hmm. work on? Cause obviously yeah. we've gone through this exercise with our clients all the time and, and we'll come up with 200 keyword yeah. phrases, but you can really focus on maybe 20 at a time for real. Right. You know? So there's a difference between building your top 20, which can be used everywhere, an AdWords campaign, other keyword-driven types of ad platforms, and then in your LinkedIn profile or in blogs or something that's not ad-related. For all of those, you need at least the 20 of your top ones. Once you get into like an AdWords campaign, you could literally have hundreds of variations. And the more unique those phrases get, the cheaper it's going to be to run those ads just because there's less competition around longer keyword phrases. Okay. So then, um, so then how do we, how do we pick and choose? Mm -hmm. So back to your last question about the AC. Yeah. Google's so smart. And this is probably the reason why I just saw last year, they made 95 billion dollars in revenue just on adwords that's it Uh, that's because they connect all the dots so if they see someone's typing in something called ac repair and they don't know what ac they refer to but the majority of the sites that people are ending up getting connected to have all air conditioners and hvac stuff and repair and they see that the dwell time on those websites is longer than say 10 seconds people are connecting with what they were looking for so google kind of feeds back into that's their job is to connect, yeah. <laughs> yes is to feed connect the dots and feed that data back into their algorithm and say okay these keywords do seem to be related to this maybe not a hundred percent of the time but we're going to put more weight here and less weight there um so usually if it's your business, you should know a little bit about the different ways people are searching. So it might be HVAC repair, AC repair, air conditioner broke, (laughs) that kind of thing. Right. Um, So the the free way to figure out the most common other ways that's searched is right at the bottom of Google search results. So if you go to the desktop version, I think mobile might have this too, um, is you type in what you think your primary keyword phrase would be scroll down to the bottom and there'll be like five other things. Like, did you also want to search for this version or this version or that version? So Google's coming right out and telling you, here's the other ways that users are searching for that same kind of keyword. Um, The other thing is auto finish. So when you start typing a phrase into Google, right in the address bar, this thing will pop down and you'll see like five or six or four little, you know, other things that it's, it thinks it's trying to predict what you're typing and it's not randomly guessing. It's basing that off of the most common things people search for 
right. when they search for those keywords. So that's the second uh, place to look. That's just really easy and obvious. After that, there's all sort of key, sorts of keyword tools. You don't need to pay for one. You can use the one that's built into AdWords called Keyword Planner Tool. You do have to have an AdWords account. You don't have to spend any money, um, but you do have to log into an AdWords account now to get to their Keyword Planner Tool. Got it. Okay, perfect. And how often should we pay attention or visit that? Because we have people that, you know, like on LinkedIn, we'll have them, you know, because we do the keyword exercise just within LinkedIn, we'll have them review that quarterly to make sure there's not changes in their industry or new skills that they want to be known for, and maybe they've changed positions. Um, What is that like for a business? How often should we visit that? I mean, most businesses don't change so dramatically that you need to be looking at this even every month. I mean, maybe quarterly, uh, maybe annually for some businesses that are really just call what they do the same thing that they've always called it. Right. And, and do, do we pay attention to uh, changes of the way people ask for things or attaching to trends? So maybe something goes into the news if we're an attorney or we're a CPA or we're an insurance and all of a sudden there's the great, liability exchange movement or something that goes into the wall street journal or the mainstream media. Right. And, and then do we, do we now go out and change a bunch of content or do we just start that day going forward? Uh, you know, yep. good question. So even in industries that don't change like banking, they don't change very often. People will always type in what are mortgage rates today, but there are certain big programs that come and go or may only be here for a certain amount of time. So the big one, you know, four or five years ago was called the HARP program, the Home Affordable Refinance Program. So banks that were trying to get more business and show up higher in Google search for that particular keyword phrase, we're writing blog posts that had that keyword in it. They were naming pages of their website that. So that could be kind of what you're referring to where even in a big established business, there could be little segments in there where you can get a leg up by starting to rank higher or get identified for certain new niche keyword phrases within your category. Right. Okay. That makes sense. All right. In the time that we have left, wow, look at that just flew by Joe. Um, there's, there's something new that we've been playing around with called identity resolution. So that means that, um, well, I'll let you define that. What does that right. mean? Identity resolution. Put most simply, it's figuring out who's on your website. Without but, them, without them filling out a form. And, and we're right. not talking abstract data like males over 40. We're talking like detailed info, phone numbers, uh, email addresses, and all kinds of other stuff. Right. So with great power comes great responsibility. So on a (laughs) consumer driven website, there are privacy laws around, even if we can figure out who those individuals are, um, we can help clients identify, store and control that data for retargeting purposes to import them into custom audiences into Facebook or Google or YouTube or any platform, even streaming TV platforms. These days you can retarget on with this kind of data. Um, but we're not, supposed to uncover like their actual name and email address. But you don't need to know that it's Bob Smith on 123 Maple Street to have a list of people that you know were specifically looking on a specific page of your website and now you want to be have you want to have the ability to remarket them forever and to store and control that data. The reason why that's really powerful is the more it's costing you or the more money you're spending up front to drive the traffic to your site. And in some cases, big companies are spending millions of dollars even right. per month on AdWords and other platforms. Or in some cases, you're in an industry with a very expensive click, like an attorney might be spending $80 per click. I've actually seen that before. Wow. So if you're spending $80 on one click, wouldn't it be good to spend maybe $80.10 per click to make that record permanent, portable, and more profitable? Absolutely. So on the consumer side, it's identifying and storing in a compliant way and making that data permanent and portable. On the B2B type stuff, the sky's the limit because there's much less uh, regulations around privacy because it's like a business looking for business type services. In those cases, we can typically uncover full lead records on who the individuals are on the site and do the other type of stuff. So the way it really works is 
we have a tracking pixel that we install on a client's site. And what that does is it looks at the visitors and whatever information it can glean from them. It might be their device ID, ad ID, browser ID, and then compares that to this massive database known as an identity graph um, where it's connected to all the big data platforms and is tracking 200 million U.S. adults every day. So if that user with a particular device ID has visited these other websites or has visited this Facebook page that's Bob Smith 90 times in that's far more than any other Facebook page that um, they're visiting. They either are Bob Smith or they're stalking Bob Smith. So <laughs> right. usually it is Bob Smith. And there's different verification levels that go through. And it ultimately ends up with like a 97% validation that the guess is correct. Wow. So the one reason why the whole data industry is shifting this way uh, away from browser cookies browser cookie based tracking is basically what we has been used up until today um, is users can always clear their cache to get rid of those trackers. Some are using cookie blockers. Some are using iOS devices that pretty much block everything. Safari browser pretty much blocks everything. Mm -hmm. So the Facebooks and Googles and different ad platforms of the world that were making billions of dollars tracking people um, are getting paralyzed now as more and more people clear their cash more often. And uh, Google, Facebook is even talking about putting a big button right in the corner of the screen that says clear everything. And wow. this could be coming like in just months now because of the pressure they're under. Um, but that wouldn't stop the ability uh, for them to be tracked using this identity technology. Right. So, um, you know, it, it sounds scary to some people, but it is compliant and the same protections that are in place now will still be in place. So a lot of people may or may not know there's like a little square in the corner of every display ad you see on any website. And that's because they're all playing by the same set of rules. If you click on that little corner of the display ad, it'll say like, hey, here's how we're tracking you and click here for more information or to opt out. If you go to any of those big global opt out for banner ad websites, you're, can, you're blocked everywhere. So even if you can be identified on a website using this new technology, if you are then on a list that's in a campaign that wants to send banner ads everywhere, you still won't see the banner ads because you've still opted out at that global level. So it's not as scary as some might perceive it to be, but it's, oh, it's very yeah. powerful. Well, and I think you made a good point when you and I were talking about this, as you said, you know what, though, I'm excited about the fact that I'm going to get more targeted ads, like things that are very specific to me. And I've been noticing as, as I dial in, um, you know, cause it used to be you click on something once or I'm searching it for a client. I'm not really looking for that. That's not really who I am. But now if you have a better identity of my, you know, what I typically like, what I patterns. buy, my social patterns are, whatever, and you know that I like, you know, cars and bourbon and, cig you know, cigars or whatever it is, now all of a sudden you can pull right in and, and identify, you know, me and give me a specific ad for something that appeals to me. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with the ad. There's even this massive push to break down the walled gardens of Facebook and Google who control everything about all of us. And it, it's like an open, it would be, it's kind of in the works though, but it will be the, open, the first open source massive people database that people are willingly putting their information into just so they can both have a better ad experience that's more personalized, but that it won't be controlled by a monopoly like a Google or Facebook. Got so, it. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. All right. Well, I'm sure uh, people have questions on this, and we can ask those and answer those online as part of uh, social media. Um, but Joe, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, educating us in this area and keeping us up to date on how to get found on Google, new technology and new AI stuff. And the time does go fast when we start digging into it. Um, let's bring uh, Monica and Jackson back on and uh, let's just see what they're picking up from this. So Monica, what'd you learn from all this? I learned that there's many options for our companies out there. Um, and there's a lot of really beneficial tools to help your company grow. And um, that's what I got. What was the one that jumped out at you? One specific thing that you think was like, wow, we got to make sure we're doing that. 
making sure we're using the correct platforms. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And especially those Google business pages, I think, are the critical ones that everybody needs to pay attention to. So, Jackson, how about you? Uh, just the identity resolution stuff. You know, I've heard Joe talk about it before in our meetings and things like that. And I just, you know, it's I learn more about it every time he talks about it. And it's, uh, it's a lot to take in. Uh, just the fact that we're able to do that, work around that. And, uh, you know, with all those cookie blockers and everything that are being used out there. And uh, I, I just think it's really cool, very futuristic stuff. Uh, but yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. And there's, some, and there's more. The uses for this go way beyond. It's kind of like blockchain technology. It's such a big new idea that people are still figuring out new avenues to use it in. So it's used in security. If you're standing at Jewel and you swipe your credit card, that signal can be sent back and, and proofed with your cell phone's identifier to say, yes, that is Dean standing there at Jewel trying to check out. So it could reduce credit card fraud. It's being used to provide a better white glove experience for like platinum card holders. So all the credit cards have the same phone number on the back. But if you have the black card, you want to talk to a human immediately or you have the rights to get that extra level of service. Well, in their whole database, now they know based on the number you're calling from, like whether or not you, what kind of member you are. So you can automatically be routed to different people based on your identity. Wow. There's all sorts of different Uh, applications now. That's crazy. Like I, that, that explains why. So like sometimes I will go and like the places where you check out and it's like kind of like an iPad that you just swipe on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it'll be like, do you want like a receipt or do you want us to email it or whatever? And then, or text it. And sometimes I'll click text and it already knows my number. Right. My phone number. (laughs) That is, I I was in New York and I did that and I was like, what? Like, how does it know? And it was like, uh, Jackson Delisle, would you like us to send it? I was like, whoa, too much information, <laughs> right? That's a great example. Yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah, oh, so man. that's insane that we're there, you know? Right. Well, we'd like to uh, have our uh, listeners check in and uh, maybe give us a little bit about one good takeaway from them. And as always, we ask that uh, whatever you learn today on the program uh, that benefits you or you think can benefit somebody else, please make sure to share that. Uh, make sure you share some of the things that Joe said, whether it's, you know, the identity resolution or how to climb to the top of Google, maybe setting up, uh, putting a little more effort into your Google business page, like he talked about, uh, making sure that you pay attention to those keywords and the usage of those keywords, but make sure you do that. And then we have a, a couple of special takeaway winners today, Jackson. Who's our two takeaway winners? Uh, Cecilia Rolo and uh, Adam Feather. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. So uh, congratulations. You'll be receiving the Starbucks gift card and you get to share what you learned with somebody over whatever you like at Starbucks. (laughs) Starbucks, what do you like? What's your favorite thing? Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Pour over coffee. You heard of this one? No. They actually have, if you ask for it. They, it takes like three times as much coffee grounds. So I can't believe it's the same price, but it is. They'll actually just put a strainer over another cup and pour the boiling hot water through the coffee with no pressure or anything. And it has like much less bitterness. It's almost like cold brew coffee, but still hot. Yeah, because I was going to say I do cold brew, but Monica, what do you like? Um, I'm not really a big Starbucks girl, but when I do, I usually go in the winter and I like my pumpkin spice. I was going to, I thought you were going to go with the peppermint, but pumpkin spice. Oh my gosh. Jackson, what about you? Uh, for the longest time I was, uh, it depends on the season. First of all, it's like holiday season. I'm all about the specialty flavors. So like pumpkin spice or, uh, uh, yeah peppermint mocha, things like that. But like in the summer, I normally, I don't really do too much coffee from Starbucks. I do the, uh, the tea and lemonade mix or just sometimes the tea. So yeah, they they have like the banana bread. (laughs) Right. Exactly. But they do, they have such a great tea selection that like, I don't normally drink tea. Like I can make a cup of coffee if I want a cup of coffee, but like tea, I don't normally go out of my way to do that. But I mean, if I'm going to go to Starbucks, they do it right. You know? Right on, right on. And Cecilia Jackson and the team will make sure they email you to those gift cards. So don't fear, they will be coming your way. 
All right. Well, from all of us here at uh, Social Jack Studios, Joe, I want to thank you again for taking time out of helping the internet to properly work for our clients. Um, And also thank Jackson and Monica and all of you for listening in. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. And we'll definitely see you online. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Influence Factory podcast. We welcome feedback and suggestions. You can provide these by visiting our website at www.myinfluencefactory.com. And if you are interested in Social Jack's 90 Days to Influence program, you can simply go to 90daystobusinessinfluence.com and simply ask for the next steps. While our program airs regularly on Zoom webcasts and Facebook Live on Wednesdays at noon central, we invite you to download episodes on your favorite channel, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and who knows where else in the future. We will also provide occasional on-location live streams with special guests that we will announce in our community Facebook group, Business Influencer Alliance, as well as on all Social Jack channels. Our mission is to help you build your digital business influence with this podcast, as well as inspire, educate, and entertain those who are hungry to collaborate in a cool place with cool business professionals just like you.